This, this is Ryan Denom. He is the founder and CEO of Nicoya Life Sciences, as you may know. Um, he is a graduate of the first class of nanotechnology engineering at the university. We went on to do a master's um, here in mechanical engineering and then started a company based on that. Um, and that's Nicoya. Now he's uh, going to talk about how it's uh, gone from, you know, from a startup to making, making big money and getting successful. <laughs> Yeah. I like that. Big so, so yeah. <laughs> cool. Without uh, much further ado, Ryan. Okay. Thanks everyone for coming. I'm really happy to be able to come out and chat with you guys today. Um, I don't want to focus too much on on what Nicoya does. I want to really just kind of focus on our experience um, building a startup company. Um, you know, with a lot of you know lessons learned and things like that. Some of it will be specific to a nanotech company, but you know, it is really uh, advice that could be applicable to any type of company um, that you might be interested in starting. So as mentioned, I was a graduate of one of the first, the first uh, nanotechnology engineering program here at UW. Um, and then I went on and did my master's. And right after that, I started Nicoya. Um, the very first funding we got was a, a grant through University of Waterloo and FedDev. Um, and then I you know, met my co-founders. Um, we really started trying to focus on what was Nicoya going to be as a business. We had a lot of ideas, but not a ton of direction. Um, eventually, when we found you know, that, that direction and we started pushing forward on it, um, we were able to build a product um, that in the last 18 months, we've pretty much gone from you know, just zero sales, just launching it in the market, to over a million in revenue, uh, which is a big milestone for us. Um, and it does take a lot of hard work, um, dedication, and, and a lot of uh, tricks and kind of some luck along the way. Um, so just to give you a really quick overview of what Nicoya does, uh, we make something called surface plasmon resonance. Um, it's an instrument that's used in the biotechnology space for analyzing how proteins and other biomolecules interact with one another. Um, it's a really important piece of equipment in drug development, drug discovery, uh, learning about diseases, um, all kinds of different applications. Uh, but the problem is it's very expensive, typically $150,000 to $200,000 to purchase one of these instruments. It's usually located in a core facility. So this means it's very difficult to get access to the equipment. You, know, you have to get trained, you have to sign up, you have to pay per hour to use it, you have to schedule your time you know, well in advance. So it's, there's a very high barrier to entry if you want to use this type of technology. So what we did is we applied our knowledge of, of the nanotechnology space. We developed a product that was over 10 times less expensive than the, the current SPR instruments on the market. Uh, we made it a bench top size, we made it easy to use. Um, and we basically marketed this product at individual researchers so that they would no longer have to go to a central core facility and use, uh, you know, use that facility to get their research. They could do it on their own bench. Um, so that's, you know, that's our product. That's our value proposition. That's why people buy the product. It's convenience. It's affordable. It allows them to get their research done faster um, and make you know, that next big discovery sooner rather than later. Um, so you know, there, is, there is a big nanotech piece there. Um, lots of development and, and work went into that, but I want to focus more on um, how to start a company and what kind of process and, and things you need, you need to go through to do that because I think there's a lot of opportunity right now for nanotech uh, engineers and, and everyone in kind of the related fields to, to really capitalize on what's going on in the Kitchener-Waterloo region right now. So the first thing is that you know, when you start a company, it really changes your entire perception of the world, in my opinion anyway. Um, so really, you need to kind of put on what I call these magic startup glasses and start looking at the world through, um, through the, the eyes of a founder of a company. So the very first thing is this idea, right? You need to come up with some concept, some idea that you're going to build this business around. So, you know, you're not going to come up with this overnight. So starting now, if you're interested in building a business, you should be looking at every problem, every opportunity every complaint you hear by your friends as a potential business opportunity, a potential product you could build to solve a problem. Um, this takes a lot of time and, and it's not an easy thing to do to find that right idea. And, and sometimes, sometimes there is no right idea. Sometimes you just have to start something um, with you know, your best guess and it might change and, and evolve a lot um, from that first idea you had. But um, the point is that you start and you, and you start you know, putting yourself in that mindset of how am I going to build a business that solves a real problem for people. So one of the things that, you know, is, this is kind of the common like startup scene, right? Like, oh, we're just going to play ping pong all day and, 
and sit and let, let the users, let the money come in, and it's just going to be this, this great time. We have investors writing checks for millions of dollars. You know, we, we could just, like, you know, it, it's going to be, you know, the, the best time ever. Why wouldn't you want to work in a startup or, or, or found a startup, for that matter? Um, but this is certainly a, a big misconception. I mean, in my experience, anyway, this is much more the reality. <laughs> You're, you know, your every day is just a grind. You know, it's not exciting every day. Um, you're kind of repeating the same thing over and over, and, and you're making these really small, you know, incremental steps forward. Um, and that's really what a startup is. I mean, you see a lot of, you know, flashy news about companies raising huge amounts of money and all this kind of, all this kind of stuff. But in reality, you know, it's just this is what, you know, 99% of of a startup is. It's just, you know, doing the dirty work. Um, working long hours for really long periods of time, you know, you don't get a lot of breaks, and it is a lot of work, and you have to make sacrifices. But um, you know, in the end, if you're prepared for this, then then that's fine. It's just you don't want to have that perception of what you know you think it's going to be, and then it being completely different from that. So, so that's I think a really important point. If anyone if anyone is is thinking about starting a company, you know, prepare to be in the mines for a little while. So. One of the first things you might you know, realize when you put on those startup glasses is that there actually is such thing as free money. Um, there's a lot of free money out there, actually. If you have a, if you have a decent idea and you've got you know, maybe some interested customers, you maybe have a prototype, there's no reason why you couldn't get $150,000 to $200,000 in completely free money. Um, you know, organizations like uh, University of Waterloo, um, OCE, Communitech, NSERC, FedDev, they have all kinds of programs to drive um, startups and drive innovation. So, you know, don't use that as an excuse. You know, it's too expensive to start a nanotech company. I, you know, I don't have access to that technology or that equipment I need. I mean, you can find ways around that, and there is, you know, there is sources of money that you can find to build your business. And as I said at the beginning, this is where Nikoi started. I mean, um, there's no way we could have built a business just off of you know our own savings because it is very expensive to you know as Katarina mentioned to prototype and build hardware it is it is an expensive process so um, you need some of that some of that funding to start you off and there is no shortage of that one hundred two hundred thousand dollars that could be available um, if you put some some time and effort into doing it so the next thing that's important is being prepared for rejection. So um, as I said, there's lots of you know, funding out there, but chances are you'll get rejected from it. Maybe the first time, maybe you'll always get rejected and you'll never, you'll never be able to get that one you know, elusive grant that you've been trying to get, um, or that one elusive investor you've been trying to, trying to get to you know, back your company. Um, but, you know, that's okay, but just be prepared for that type of thing. I think a lot of people in nanotech are, are, are overachievers, are you know, excellent at everything they do, so sometimes it can be hard to, to realize that you know, there are a lot of other really good companies out there um, also competing for this funding. So you know, that's going to happen. And you know, we've, have, we've had lots of stories of rejection. People don't really talk too much about that type of thing when they, you know, when they, when they talk about their companies. But um, one example for us is in the pretty early days, we were, um, we were in the kind of final round of selections for an incubator in the in the Bay Area, and it was you know it was a pretty prestigious incubator. We probably would have would have changed the trajectory of our company quite substantially. Um, you know, so we went down and, and did our pitch and did our final meetings and everything. Um, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. This was a very expensive trip. It was very last minute. Um, so we you know took the risk, went down there, and in the end, you know, we 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 pitched. We felt pretty good about it, and we came back. One or two days later, we got you know got the call that we didn't get in. And this was, a, this was a pretty hard time. I mean, we put a lot of resources into that. Um, we felt like, well, if they, if they don't value our business, if they, don't val if they can't validate us, you know, is our business really worth something? So that was definitely a challenging time. And you know, I think we all kind of felt like, maybe, this, maybe we shouldn't keep doing this. Like, is this really the right thing? Are we onto something or not here? Um, but the important thing to remember is that you know, they don't necessarily know if your business is going to succeed or fail. Like, no one really knows that, and it's up to you to make it succeed. So don't, you know, let other people and, and rejection really, really get you down too much. Just, you know, be able to kind of take that, learn from it, and move on to the next stage where you get to reject people. <laughs> so this is important because your time is limited, your money is limited, um, 
You need to focus on the important stuff that's going to add value for your business. Um, so, you know, whether it's, whether it's, you know, someone just volunteering their time for you. I mean, if it's not the right person, they're not going to add value. It's just going to, it's just going to waste a lot of your time. So you need to start, you know, you need to get very, um, you need to get very kind of obsessed about how you're spending your time and who you're spending it with, um, which can be a little challenging, um, but um, it's something you need to prepare to do. And, and everyone's out there to help you, and, and it's all great, but you, know, you need to make sure you focus your time on the important stuff. And you know, we've had a lot of, um, we've had a, you know, a few acquisition offers and everything, and, and we've had to reject those because we didn't think it was the right thing for our company. Um, that stuff's always hard. The decisions are difficult, but you have to be prepared to do that. Um, we, re we actually rejected um, an offer to go into a, another accelerator in the Bay Area. So that was like a nice little redemption piece. Um, and we also had, you know, we also had, when we were raising our, our seed round, um, we had an, our first, in, our lead investor write the check and things were going great. And then we had an angel group that was, you know, also really interested in investing. But what ended up happening was, you know, they wanted essentially better terms than our lead investors. And this put us in a really awkward position because, you know, we needed to get the rest of the funding to close the round out, but um, we couldn't really give these new investors better terms than our, than our current ones. So we had to just, we made the tough decision to, you know, forego that funding and tell them, you know, thanks, but no thanks. And that was, you know, that was very scary for us because uh, we had to raise this funding. We had the money there. We chose not to take it. Um, luckily, a couple of weeks later, we found someone new. They were, you know, they had the, the right terms, they had the funding, and, and we closed with them. But um, it's just there's going to be a lot of situations that you don't really anticipate having to, having to deal with when you start a, a nanotech-based company. But these are some of the types of decisions and situations that you, know, you have to be, be prepared to deal with. The other important thing is um, to find the right people to join your team. Um, and this doesn't always mean you know, it's, the, it's the best people. It's not necessarily like the top um, person in this field or the top person in that field or the person with 20 years of experience in business. Those aren't necessarily the right people to join your early stage startup. You need people that are willing to do whatever it takes to make the company successful. They're willing to sacrifice. They understand what it means to be in a startup. So you know, when you're, if, you, if you're thinking about starting a company and you're looking for a team, Keep that kind of stuff in mind because it really does make a big difference. Because when times get tough, you know, if your two other founders, you know, decide that they can't handle this and they leave, that's gonna be that's gonna be really difficult. You know, so you want to make sure you can find people that are committed and dedicated. They may not be, you know, the top of the top, or they, or they may be. Who knows? But you know, you just want to get those people that are absolutely dedicated to the business, um, and they'll do whatever it takes to to be successful. And you know, we got lucky. I think we kind of got the best of both worlds. You've got people that are amazing at what they do, um, but they're also so dedicated to the business. And I think that's also um, a part of the culture we try and build at Nicoya. But um, that's definitely something to keep in mind because the team is absolutely one of the most important parts of a, of a startup. So another thing is that, you know, that I found anyway, um, and maybe I was a bit naive when I started the company, but you know, there's a lot of rules and policies and, and regulations that exist in the world, and these are all very important. But um, as a startup, there's no way you can possibly, you know, make sure you follow every single rule and every single policy that is in existence. If you do that, you'll have a really hard time being successful. Um, you just you can't move fast enough, and that's really the big advantage you have over your competitors is that they have to follow all these rules and they have to do everything, you know, by the book, and they have a huge legal department to make sure that all happens. So, you know. If, Keep that in mind as well, because it's something that allows you to move faster, and you have to always, you know, leverage, you know, the the cost of doing this, doing doing this versus not doing this, um, to you know follow those rules and regulations. But you know, it's it is something that we found that you know no one's necessarily policing every single little checkbox that you know you need to keep an eye on. So just make sure you keep that in mind. So there's a lot of different things you can worry about when you start a company. Um, you know, there's everything from IP to the team to the culture, uh, finance, HR, legal. There's so many things to think about that it can be really easy to lose sight of what's important for the business. 
And definitely the most important thing is finding paying customers. So you know, everything you do should be geared towards finding those paying customers. Um, you shouldn't be doing activities that you know, seem like they're building your company. You should be doing things that are finding new customers, making your customers happy. Um, and then your company will, will you know, grow as a result of doing that. Um, the hardest thing you know, can be finding those first customers. There's obviously a lot of new um, avenues out there, like Kickstarter is amazing, and all these other platforms to find early adopters and early customers. But you know, for us, our product and, and a lot of you know, B2B type, type transactions or, or type products, um, you know, Kickstarter is not a great avenue for that type of thing. So um, for us, you know, we had to do a lot of creative things to try and find our first, our first set of paying customers. So you know, one thing we did was we went a lot, you know, a lot of the local researchers here, we got them on board. Um, you know, they, they bought in on our, our beta units. Um, but we promised them, you know, that we would upgrade those, those products to the next revision for free pretty much until the end of time because we wanted to make sure that they were taking a chance on us. We wanted to make sure they felt, you know, comfortable and that they were going to get, you know, the best product they could in the end. So um, it is really difficult to, to get those first few customers in the door. But once you do, if you can, you can treat them right and make them advocates for your company and for your product, it will definitely pay off big time as you grow the business. So once you get those customers, you have to be very um, willing to ship something that you're not overly happy with. Um, if you wait, you know, till the product's perfect to ship it, um, it's probably going to be too late. So our first units were were very, you know, crude prototypes. Really, um, they were, you know, digi key boxes that we that we 3D printed parts into and assembled by hand and, and shipped them out. Um, you know, we knew they weren't going to they weren't going to last long. They weren't going to be on the market for too long, but that allowed us to get them out the door as fast as possible, get a lot of feedback, iterate quickly. Um, unfortunately, this was prior to the V1 being available, so we spent a lot of money um, getting you know, next day delivery on, on boards from, from out west and stuff like that. So um, you know, spent a lot, of, a lot of time and effort on that, on that type of thing. But that's what you have to do. You have to be not afraid to, to ship something out that you know, it's not your best work, but you know you're going to improve on it later. Um, and just make sure the expectations are set properly with those early customers and, and that they know what they're getting into. Um, and then everything's fine. As long as their expectations are aligned with yours, um, you know, they'll be happy in the end. So one other important thing to remember is, you know, don't get sucked into this you know, predefined pathway of how you, how you have to build a business. There's a lot of ways to build a company. Um, sometimes it's hard to see those different paths because a lot of it's kind of in the media all the time. It's, you know, this company raises this much money or goes to YC or whatever. There's a ton of different ways to build a company. There's a ton of really successful companies in this area. Um, so don't, you know, just get sucked into that one way of thinking. And if, if I can't do, if I can't build my business this way, there's no way it's going to happen because there's so many pathways to get um, to success with a company. And I think that from a nanotech perspective, we have a lot of really cool advantages over the other, you know, types of companies that exist. So, you know, we make a lot of really cool stuff. Um, <laughs> I didn't know it was going to be filmed, so I should have asterisked that one out. Um, it's probably going to get pulled off YouTube now. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, this is a huge advantage you have over, you know, like a software company. Um, you've got this amazing technology that probably no one will understand. You know, none of your investors will really understand how it works. And um, it's, it's really uh, a unique advantage that can help you stand out. Um, it also gives you, you know, better hold on IP. Um, it's easier to get customers interested because you have this very unique proposition now. You're not just copying what everyone else does. You have some new technology that no one's ever seen before. So you know, own that and embrace it as a nanotech engineer or in a related field. You know, embrace that uniqueness that you have and don't be afraid that you, know, you, you don't look like the classical you know, software company because um, this is really you know, your, your way to stand out. So as I kind of said at the beginning, like, I think there is a lot of potential for people that want to start their own companies. And you know, it's definitely not right for everybody. Um, it is a, a lot of work, and it takes a lot of time, and it doesn't happen overnight. Um, but there are a lot of really amazing 
things that come of it and value you bring to the world in general. Um, one of my favorite parts is you know, bringing people into the team. And because we're in a startup, everyone has to kind of push themselves. And I really like the fact that you know, we, the founding team has created this environment where you know, we can push you know, everybody to be better and do more than they maybe ever expected they could do because you know, in a startup, that's what you have to do. You have to get uncomfortable. You have to do things that you, know, you weren't trained to do. Um, you have to realize that you know, those rules don't have to apply to you. you know, I don't have to have a background in sales to go sell a million dollars worth of product. So I think it's, there's so much that you can benefit from starting a company, but there are also a lot of challenges. Um, so I just want to end it with you know, what you guys think is the biggest challenge. Like, What's stopping you from starting your own nanotech company tomorrow? Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. I think we have a, a time for a couple of questions. So, any questions? Okay, we'll be right there. Hi there. So, my question is: You mentioned that you went to graduate school. I was wondering how much of your success with Nicoya would you attribute to going to grad school, and do you think that's a necessary? thing for someone to do if they want to start their own tech company where it may not be as simple as you know getting right out of undergrad and starting making an app or something like that yeah that's a really good question um, for me it was essential because I didn't really have the knowledge or the background to be able to like from the technical standpoint to to start building that that product I mean I learned so much through grad school that was directly applicable to the product um, and it gives you this opportunity to do that in a very like safe and controlled environment. Like, if it doesn't work, you can try something else. Um, so, I, for me personally, it was it was essential. Um, and I think it's a great a great way of doing it if you can find a professor or a group that does work in a field where you see potential and you have some ideas. It is a good way to, to kind of um, you know get a big chunk of the early R and D done. Um, that being said, there's a lot of you know conflicting things that can happen. Um, you have to be careful of like IP and ownership and, and things like that. Um, but if you can find the right group, I think it's a, a good way of doing it for sure. Um, so I just had a quick question. Uh, before you started Nikoya, or as you were getting into the idea, did you face any serious barriers that were that might have held you back, and how did you get around that? Yeah, definitely. So um, I'd say some of the early barriers we faced, um, we were initially building more you know, medical diagnostic type products. That was sort of our first vision was, was to go that route. Um, and we faced a lot of difficulties in raising funding around that concept. Um, and I mean, with a medical device, it's a, a long regulatory pathway um, to get to a product that's in the market. So that was a lot of, there's was, there was definitely challenges there. Um, so that's kind of why we changed focus and started building the OpenSPR product. Um, we were always kind of building it, but we made it our main focus. So, so yeah, that was definitely a challenge. Um, investors like to see things that you know, are going to give them returns a little earlier than, than five or six years out. It's not saying that's impossible. Um, you just need to find the right investors that would, that would be a good fit for that, that type of company. Um, something that, I mean, something we find a challenge now is, is finding the right talent. Um, it, can be, it can be definitely challenging to find the right people for the roles we want to fill, um, especially with all of the great tech companies in Waterloo now. Um, it's more and more competitive to find uh, and hire and retain good people. So that's more of like a recent challenge, not necessarily something in the earlier days, but um, so yeah, if anyone's sort of looking for, for a job soon, <laughs> check out our website. We have a couple posted there, so. Thank you. With that, I'd uh, like to thank Grant for giving such a great talk. And of course, we won't leave you without a goose. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah. It's a pleasure. And, uh,